Roger. Here we go. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? Good. It's good to see you again. So I got a headphone and everything. Uh, still waiting on Jeff. He just texted me, said he was running uh, a few minutes late. So we're just hanging out, waiting for him. What you been up to? Well, we're very busy. The uh, Tight Network is going through a big kind of rethink. Well, it seems like at my age, you start doing a lot of reunions. <laughs> Uh, yep. and this next weekend, not this weekend, there's, um, the 50th anniversary of May Day, which was a big demonstration in Washington. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, with a bunch of friends put out a newspaper for that, uh, that was independent. It was, a, yeah, I would say it was in favor. I mean, it was anti-war. It was in favor of the demonstration, but it was not, right. we were not participants. We were trying to be journalists. As it turned out. 80% of us were arrested anyway. 12,000 people were arrested. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, it makes, uh, and everyone forgets, but there is actually the Weather Underground bombed the Capitol, uh, a room in the basement of the Capitol, right before or the like April that year. And um, everyone forgets about that. <laughs> but uh, Mitchell and uh, Nixon, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Kleindings uh, in the White House were just completely thrown into a frenzy. So they way overreacted. Um, they actually ended up uh, setting a, a lot of legal precedent in the courts because almost none of the, I mean, the only convictions that held were, were people confessed to get out of jail. Right. And the, the um, the Supreme Court made a ruling on it. And it's basically what you have a right. <laughs> you're the right of free speech in this country, <laughs> and uh, it was largely a non you know nonviolent civil disobedient thing. Um, but uh, you know, Nixon had promised to get rid of to stop the Vietnam War, but you know he was elected in '68. This is '71, right? And it was still going on. Still went on for a while, so uh, yeah, it was. It's I had forgotten most about it. There was an amazing book that Larry Roberts um, from the uh, oh I knew from the Washington Post. He quite a good reporter. Spent I mean it's a four hundred page book about the culture, about the people, about the White House. I don't know how he found so much information. The FBI and the Washington Police Department. And then the legal stuff. And he has it, it's, it's blow by blow. What's the name of that book? It's called Mayday 1971. Really good nice. book. So you put together a, a publication uh, for the around the demonstration. Who else was on this? Oh, look at that. This was the last, or last, no, the next, we had May 5th too. But this is actually a, uh, the, the demo plan for the day. So that was actually oh, wow. live news of where you're supposed to go and hang out for the protest. <laughs> yeah, today's uh, targets, it says. Yeah, well, the idea was they were blocking uh, traffic, the sitting down on the street, and um, uh, yeah, no more business as usual was one of the slogans. <laughs> anyway, cool. I found my group from this event. Yeah. Uh, many of them I've been in touch with. Famous photographer, uh, David Travis, who became the Art Institute of Photography curator uh, for many, many years, built in a building, should be called the Travis Building. <laughs> and uh, other people did other things. Steve Cook, who was a reporter, was put in jail. He later became the big PR guy for the, the uh, National Association of Real Estate Brokers, the, the realtors, Okay. which I thought. And then he worked for uh, one of the big PRs. Uh, for, for years, like people like the Shah and Noriega. Right. <laughs> this class. Anyway, here's cool. Jeff. Yeah, it's Jeff. Meet Roger. Hello. Roger. Jeff. Hi, Roger. Everybody has ceiling fans. <laughs> you got a ceiling fan? Look at that. Very nice. I don't, <laughs> I don't have a ceiling fan. What? 
Yeah, I've got a ceiling. Oh, now I just, I've, I've, I just got to watch out. <laughs> you got to reframe it. Yeah, I had it all like straight. So sort of. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited for you two to meet and for us to uh, hear from Roger about, uh, what Roger and I chatted recently um, after not having seen each other in a long while. And uh, so I'm anxious to recap some of the conversation we had there and, and get into some stories. Uh, Jeff is a um, longtime collaborator uh, of mine. We work together at the consultancy and uh, are now continuing to work together in, uh, at Illustrious at our new, our new venture. New thing. So you were just telling me a little bit about the type network. Um, can we start there? Because that sure. feels like that's, that's what I'm doing. your project and your business now. So like, what is the a type foundry? What is the type network? Just tell us about what that what's going on. Well, uh, the type network is a distributor for uh, some of the leading type foundries uh, in the US and, and Europe, uh, in Latin America. Uh, there are more than 30 foundries and it's growing. Uh, we have a uh, you know, very simple site, tightnetwork.com, where you can license fonts uh, for all kinds of things, uh, web fonts or for single user or for your whole company, whatever you got. And, uh, you know, the, the type foundry business in its current form has been going since the uh, well, late 80s. Uh, Postscript fonts started in the 80s. And the uh, Font Bureau, which is one that I helped start, uh, originally was part of my, my design studio, uh, was 89. And, and at the same time, there was another one called Emigre, which uh, had a, a lot of, a lot of it got a lot of attention. But after that, in the 90s, quite a few uh, designers got into designing fonts or in some of the people who had been working with the old line type companies, which had been in, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of change in the type business. Well, there's always been that way. It, uh, it, it's uh, at least in my lifetime, it's been a constant from phototype to digital type to desktop to web fonts, the variable fonts. Uh, and the opportunity here is pretty amazing because the people's awareness of, of type uh, has grown. And so what Type Network is trying to do is connect them with the, with the best stuff. Uh, it's interesting in, in this era, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, the low price has been set by Google. It's zero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so if you want to go at the low end, you, <laughs> you got a big guy <laughs> to, to compete with. Right. So what we're trying to do is go to the area where people really care about getting a typeface that reflects their brand, their personality, their product, uh, any number of different things, their organization, their, their values. And uh, there are a lot of fonts out there, but we think we have a really great collection. I was just on vacation in Asheville and on the drive up, we were listening to a podcast called Away With Words. And it's a uh, male and female co-hosts and they, uh, they talk about word origins and etymologies and they talk about oh. linguistics and phrases and try to trace like, where did this phrase come from and how long have we used it and uh, how it's kind of jumped around geographically or culturally and, and taken hold in different areas. They shared a story uh, on one of the episodes that we listened to on the trip. Um, and I forget what book this story comes from, but it was about a, um, uh, somebody who was commissioned to develop a typeface. Uh, this is probably, you know, I don't know, you know, like late 19th century. I don't know when this was, but to develop a typeface and and then his organization got bought and the typeface was included in the sale. So it was acquired. So he had these trays of, you know, the metal cubes, like the, the blocks, the, that, yeah, the, the font. Yeah, exactly. That you would load in the machine and the press and, you know, and, and use uh, to press the, the books or the posters or whatever. Uh, so he's got these trays of the metal fonts. And uh, because he was so protective of the face even though it was part of the sale he would go on these walks uh, along the thames and he would take a handful of the fonts and put them in his pocket and just like he was feeding birds he would toss them over the edge of the bridge 
and yeah. slowly over time he got rid of all of this font because he was so protective he didn't want anybody else to own this font that he had designed and he slowly eradicated it what he thought from the face of the earth and just now i guess in the past like five years or so somebody has gone into the river and fact because they were like that's that can't be true that's got to be an old wives tale like, it's got to be a you know myth right well somebody's found like yeah these are the the felt types. Types of them uh they were they're older than that they were like 18th century okay uh, and uh they that's what happened i don't know i don't know the, the whole story of why he threw them away uh, yeah, they said he didn't want this other guy. He had partnered. He didn't want this other guy to have him, right? Yeah. <laughs> what did you call them? The, the, his name or the company's name was Fell. I'd have to look it up. Okay. But uh, before, I think it's before Caslon. So that would have to be 18th century um, or early 18th century. Because uh, Caslon was 18th century too. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah, England uh, had had fonts. Uh, from the time of Caxton, the first printer, and, uh, and but they weren't that great, and they in, imported most of their fonts from a lot of them from Holland. Uh, Holland was a big trading, you know, center, and they had they've had I think continue to be one of the great type com countries in the world, uh, and now it's all you know, all digital, all. Uh, pretty advanced theory about type about type and and uh, but then they had uh, some fantastic printers uh, and and type founders and the English imported those and I think fell and then Caslon copied those that was the idea but I'm not a historian so so I will my stay, question someone is, will write in the actual thing have you ever had a font that you've designed that you felt so protective over that you were like if I can't have her no one can have her <laughs> no, <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't work it, anymore. I don't think it necessarily worked then. Uh, you know, when we do a, a custom or what we, some people say bespoke, when we do a brand font for a company, uh, and I, I've been doing this for a long time now, and uh, when, when we started the foundry, I tried to explain to the, to the customer that, Look, because uh, they, they would always want that font. I want that font. I want that to be my font. I'm paying all this money. It's cute. I want it exclusive. <laughs> and the thing about exclusive fonts is that uh, if they're good, they are copied. Uh, and this was true when people had their had a proprietary system like a linotype machine. Linotype prided themselves, or Mergenthaler linotype, we call it, was uh, they were very, very happy with their font library. And that was how they sold machines. You can get this font if you buy our machine. Uh, you can buy this imitation machine intertype and it's, they don't have those fonts. And similarly, there, there's another company in, in it that is later centered in England, Monotype, uh, uh, a slightly different contra contraption. They had another set of fonts. So buy Monotype machines. But in both cases, and this actually goes back all the way to the beginning of type, if there was something good, even if they wouldn't sell it, they would be it would be pirated. Uh, so if you have a great brand font, uh, then and you, you're trying to keep it yourself and it's really great, uh, someone won't copy it. And right. then then uh, you've wasted your money. And then they say, they, the client says, yeah, but what happens if it's not popular? I said, so, well, you still waste your money. <laughs> <laughs> so right. what we try to do is make them a deal uh, get, uh, lower upfront costs. We share the production costs, and then after uh, some period of exclusivity, uh, two years, five years, whatever, whatever is agreed, then we get the font in, back into our library, and we can sell to other people. Oh, nice! Okay. And and actually, the Linotype learned over the years: if they license a font, uh, you can get revenue on it. If you don't license a font, they copy it. Right. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Jeff, I want you to be able to jump in here. Any questions for Roger? Kick us off. Um, yeah, actually. So I was reading um, one of your blog posts, and it was the it was it was ten rules, and I think it was the the eighth rule said um, something along the lines of the best the best publishers 
or the best designers treat themselves as agents of the reader? Oh yeah, nice question. I guess I set that up, but the, the, I always love those lists of rules because they usually when you do like a, a, a talk, mm -hmm. you know, Ted's famous for this, uh, you got to leave them something they can remember. So <laughs> give right. us a, a 10 best or anything. So I always kind of, you know, it tends, turns out that most of my 10 best lists are the same, even if I haven't written them down anywhere, because I don't, I don't, I don't know that much. I'm going to come up with the same about, same ideas. And, but that one's a very, uh, a very interesting idea in terms of understanding what design is uh, versus art and also understanding design style uh, today. Uh, what that's saying is that I think that the role of a graphic designer and particularly for a typographer is to help the user, help the reader, uh, help them understand it, help them enjoy it, uh, help them remember stuff. Uh, make them, you know, it, it make it into an experience they they can they want to come back to or continue. Um, and people say, what is the first thing a, a, a designer like you is supposed to do? And I said, it it's make it easy to read. If you're working with text, if you're a typographer, you're working with text. And I'm not writing this stuff. <laughs> and uh, very often, the editor imagines or even the writer imagines that people will read the whole thing. Uh, they never do. I mean, I don't know if, they, if they've ever read anything all the way through. <laughs> Maybe they do. But most of us get through from, and then we get distracted or it's not any good or you know, we start jumping around. Uh, very few people just sit there and go you know, all the way through line by line. I mean, there are some people who like it that way. But um, uh, the job of the graphic of the typographer is to like lift the meaning, lift, lift the words out of the text so that people can say, oh, that's what it's about. Or so you do, you try to do chapter titles, you try to do clever headlines, you try to do pull quotes that lift out interesting parts of the, of the text. You write captions under the pictures so they could, because everyone reads the caption first. Uh, and you know, in the in the magazine era, we would, you know, want people to turn pages, go all the way through. We, the, the ulterior motive is to so they see the ads. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, the idea of a good magazine is to put a lot of interesting things together. And the experience isn't great, isn't maximum if you don't see it all. If, if you just read one piece like today, you'll get a link and you'll just jump into what could be a fairly interesting amount of stuff, but you never see the rest of it. And they don't, the reading experience is funny. One of the bloggers I read was saying, hey, they, we haven't actually improved the reading experience now for about 10 years on, mm -hmm. on, in digital. Uh, there are a lot of experiments. I did one called Tree Saver 10 years ago, and we're trying to make it better and, and, and more flexible. And basically what happened was that the, the, the business model kind of stalled out. And so the money to develop those things uh, isn't there anymore. You know, Kindle hasn't changed significantly in five years, has it? You know, that's right. interesting. It used to change like every month, it would be annoying. Right. <laughs> and and uh, I think though that going back to it is that there are kind of two styles of designers. Um, some designers like put their themselves in the front. They they it's not necessarily ego, it's their definition of art. Uh, mm -hmm. they think of this as art. They they want their stuff to be all recognizable. Oh. I won't name any names, but you could. <laughs> I'll give you a list on the side of names <laughs> that you can always tell that they designed it. Right. Uh, that's not always a good thing, you know. Uh, does you know just to shift so I don't insult anybody in, in the in the graphic design business? If you go to architecture, okay. uh, do Frank Gehry's buildings actually work, or do they just look like branded Frank Gehry? <laughs> and yeah. uh, or Zaha Hadid, you know, the late Zaha Hadid. Both brilliant, totally brilliant, amazing. I mean, if I were the the uh, people who developed the Disney Hall in LA, I wouldn't care if you could only fit 20 people into the auditorium. I, it's a major landmark that put the place on the map forever. And that's, okay, fine, we'll take it. Uh, but at the same time, other architects think about, oh, can they find how to get in the building? <laughs> now, I don't know if you've been to the Disney <laughs> Hall, but that is actually, it. if there weren't signs, right. it's not obvious. <laughs> you know, you yeah. go to Grand Central Station, you know exactly where to go in. 
Right. The and last it, time we talked, you you made an analogy to architecture. You said something about retail, something about the difference between graphic design and architecture and retail being unafraid to be like really innovative, but typically the homes we see. Yeah. Are yeah. Commercial is, is, is modern traditional. And, and, and domestic is traditional. So and, tell us about that. Like why, why are we, why, why do we are, why are we afraid to live in a really radically rethought space? It's, it's completely cultural. If you go to Holland, or even Norway or Brazil, they're not afraid. They want it current, they want it fun, they want it modern, they want it made out of concrete so that it's cheaper to build <laughs> and, and will last. Um, and it, it's about their self, self uh, definition, their self esteem. Americans want to associate themselves much more with the kind of as the, the past, the, the, the traditional beautiful house mm -hmm. in New England or, or in colonial Spain, mm -hmm. <laughs> colonial Latin America, or some, something, some kind of uh, association like that makes them feel so much better. So for example, I just was looking at getting kitchen, new kitchen cabinets, and they're all are paneled. You know, they're all, uh, they all have a frame around every door mm -hmm. and some kind of insets and some kind of molding. And if you want it just flat, just a door, no, we don't make those. <laughs> because nobody asks for those. They don't want, they want that. It makes them feel better about themselves. Uh, and so, I mean, that kind of tradition is very, you can't really, that's culture. You can't really go against that. Um, it's interesting that that gets to a whole nother kind of thing, which is how long should these cultural trends last? Right. You know, uh, the you know in the old days everything was was um, chronological. You know, if you look at the art history books, or if you look at the history of type uh, books about the history of type, every every era that built on the previous era. Now you can say that the in the Baroque, well, first first you can say Gothic was a big sidetrack, and then they had Neoclassicism, but then they went to Baroque. That was. But you know, you saw it unfolding one step at a, at a time in different countries. And then uh, in the late 19th century, uh, revivals, eclecticism started, where they were taking styles. It, the, uh, the architectural movement was called Beaux Arts, uh, where they were they're trying to build a pure French cathedral right here in Manhattan. And uh, they, were, they were kind of scored in the architectural uh, magazines for how close it was to the way the French would have built it in the 17th or 15th century. It's like uh, a French, French Gothics, like really? But, <laughs> and I think that at that time, those linear development of, of style started becoming confusing for us. Uh, everything, we had revivals on top of revivals. And so if you drive down a typical American street, uh, and you saw this also in, in, in commercial buildings in the, in the 20s. Everything was, oh, that's Tudor, that's, that's Greek, that's Latin, that, you know. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, you know, you can have somebody that's got a, what it looks like a plantation house with columns next to some kind of uh, a Tudor house with a, with a <laughs> big gable roof, yeah. you know, next to a Spanish or uh, colonial house, you know. Uh, it's like, really? Uh, and that that happened in type two, where where you used to be able to, to the, the classifications of typographical forms were very chronological, up to about 1890, and then all hell broke loose. <laughs> and ever since, it's very hard to to class. You can't classify that way anymore. Uh, and my my point though is that in um, in in trying to set to a style, you're always going to eventually run off the cliff that that no style lasts forever right and your trick is to figure out like uh how long what is the personality of the brand or what is it in, in publications i used to always think about this with magazines how long should the look of a magazine last mm -hmm. you know in when i was a kid it seemed like magazines like time or reader's digest had been that way forever 
they <laughs> actually hadn't been, but maybe they're for 30 years. The longest uh, magazine design that I've ever had stay in place was Newsweek, and it was 15 years. Uh, Rolling Stone, we had, they had a weird revival. They completely mm -hmm. changed it, like I did my work in the late 70s. In the early 80s, they completely, you know, wiped it clean and started with something entirely different. Uh, it was pretty well done, but it was not the same thing. And a lot of people say, what happened to the Oxford rules around the pages? And, uh, and then Fred Woodward, a famous art director, came in and he exactly revived what we had done in the 70s. It was like, it was bizarre. It was like an acid flashback. <laughs> And uh, and then built on from there. I called him up and I said, Fred, did you, is this new Rolling Stone, is that the only one of them? Or did you just make one for me? Or, or they all look like this. So I've got this question of linearity and time with with type, you you worked on a project for, for Palm, you worked on the Palm Pre, right? When it was trying to oh, yeah. compete with the iPhone. No one remembers Talk to that. me about... <laughs> that and working with type specifically for technology and UX and user interface mm -hmm. and the future of type in tech. Interesting. Well, um, the Palm project was a was a, a, a wonderful uh, set of uh, coincidences. Um, a friend, a friend of mine who worked uh, with. Uh, the, my web company, Interactive Bureau, that we sold in 1999, so that dates me. Uh, Peter Carney was uh, very good friends with John Rubenstein, who um, who was known as uh, Doctor iPod or Doc or Mister iPod. I can't remember which. He uh, was a, a ma manufacturing VP for Apple, Ruby, he's called, uh, and had figured out how to, to uh, manufacture Apple hardware in China with the same uh, build quality as they could get in the US or Europe. And they had already been doing some stuff in Singapore, but they were moving to the mainland. And uh, he made Steve Jobs a fortune on that. I mean, the, the iPod was an amazingly, you know, a, a very big, important turn in, in Apple's history. And he made a, a, a fantastic profit margin. People loved them. I mean, the podcast was invented. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of, the whole thing is pretty amazing. So he finally decided he had worked with Steve Jobs about, his, about as much as he needed to, and he retired. Took his money and moved to Acapulco and lives, uh, lives in, still there in a very big house on the cliff. He has a place in San Francisco too. Uh, and then at, at that point, the Palm, the famous for the Palm Pilot had kind of fallen off in, in uh, sales. There was competition, uh, there, the smartphone was starting. I don't think, I mean, the iPhone, I can't remember the exact uh, moment the iPhone appeared, but we had like Sony Ericsson made a smartphone that was quite good. Uh, that had a web browser on it, uh, and there were others. Uh, and so the Palm was beginning to look a little bit like a pager, you know, one of these interesting interim things. So here we got to we got to do a phone. We hear Apple's making this phone, but who's going to build this phone for us? We don't have, you know, we, we can't build this in Canada. We can't, you know, we've got to find get the cost basis down. So, and the, uh, Ruby was the genius for this, and they. The, the, the investor said, let's get John Rubenstein. And they made an offer, which he accepted. And anyways, Carding, my, our, our mutual friend said, why don't you get Roger in to help you with the, the branding and design? And they already had some good people there. They, they had uh, Peter Skillman, who uh, later went to Nokia. He's, I don't know, I think he may be at, at uh, Microsoft now. I, I can't remember. He's been at he's been at a lot of the big companies. He he's like much more. He looks like a designer. He he uh, he has his presentation. What is what does a designer look like? What is that? Uh, look? They're tall, pretty good looking, have a really great clothes, okay, <laughs> and fantastic slide presentations. 
<laughs> Essentially, at all times, as far as I can tell, <laughs> everything is presented. And uh, but he he had the idea. He brought the the idea that you know our branding has to go everywhere. The UI is brand. The box is brand. The product, uh, you know, uh, physical design is brand. Everything is brand. And that was fairly new thinking at this moment. And then uh, the other guy, uh, gee, fortunately you could edit this, <laughs> this, <laughs> this brain numbness, uh, will come to me in a minute, is now the VP design at Google mm. uh, from Chile. Uh, and he, he was doing the real UI. He had come from um, uh, another another kind of palm-like uh, device uh, and had done some, some of the uh, software and had come up with the idea of cards for UI where, uh, and hello, this is exactly what the iPhone and, and Android use now, where it's a card, you, you can swipe, you can see mm. all the things you, you stacked up. Yeah, wow. And uh, he invented this idea, or at least he adapted it for this kind of product. And uh, so, and then there was a, uh, a couple of other really good, you know, engineer designers there. So I came in really on that uh, with the, the, the idea pretty, pretty well cooked up, but they, 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 wanted, they wanted to use, and I think I'm allowed to say this, they wanted to use Frutiger for the typeface. No, not Frutiger, Avenir, the mm. Futura-like uh, Adrian Frutiger typeface. But uh, Monotype, wanted their wanted uh, a giant amount of money, but they wanted to pay, uh, be paid by the unit, you know, a dollar a oh. phone or whatever the number was. Well, they were planning to make 2 million phones in the first 12 months, you know. Right. So 12, $2 million was a little rich for their, their budget. Now I'm, I'm making up those numbers, but it was a big, it was big numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Carnick said, well, if you're working with the graphic design, why don't you think about the font? What, what is, what would you do? And how much would that cost? And I said, well, we could do anything. And, you know, if, if, if we will do it for a, for a half or less, if you get a two-year exclusive. Mm -hmm. And um, they argued to be the, the same argument. And then David Burlow, got very interested and he uh he's my partner at the fun bureau uh was my partner at the fun bureau and he has a wonderful instinct for ui he, he worked at apple on ui fonts in 1989 and 1990 91 at the time true type was it was introduced and he's done the same thing at microsoft he's got his fingerprints on all of those operating systems and mm -hmm. uh has an understanding you know a little tiny low resolution type how do you want it to look Right. and still have style. Uh, and so we did it. Uh, and that was the typeface is now called Opera, and it's in the Font Bureau Library and Type Network. Uh, and there's uh, in, in the uh, that page, you'll probably run a link to the Roger Black collection on Type Network. There's a little story about it. Uh, and it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty successful type, I think. Uh, it's one of David's great, great fonts. And as far as the future of type, I mean, you said the type is the type on the UI and the UX and then the brand, it's all kind of consistent. Is that where we can expect this to go? Or I mean, where do you predict? I think it's gone going? there already. I think that, you know, you see that at, at, at Apple, their font is called San Francisco. They mm -hmm. use it for packages. They use it for labels on the phones, everything. Yeah. Uh, at, um, at Google, it's, uh, well, it's no, no, and open sand. Uh, and they're now, they're, they have display versions. They've size out what we say, optical size of uh, masters so that they can get very small with them or very big, depending on the use and, and scale. Uh, and then uh, Microsoft has Seago uh, and those are used everywhere. They're on the building signs, right. uh, you know, so that's IBM had a similar story where they thought they were paying too much license to get uh, uh, fees for Helvetica. So they made their own, they ended up making their font open source, which is interesting because it just, 
you know, they didn't care. They're not going to make any, you know, that's not their business, making money on FODs. That's nuts. So <laughs> we'll just give it away. And then we don't have to distribute it. When, when a, when a uh, vendor needs the font to print, you know, something for us or to create, you know, some website or anything, yeah, I guess it's, 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 it's in GitHub. Go ahead. <laughs> Leave mm -hmm. us alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's really, that was kind of interesting. Uh, and that's actually been copied uh, by others now. That that, but I would say that's the high end. Uh, the at the low end, that doesn't say the individual level. Uh, that's probably where the real future of type is, because, you know, when in 1990 we had a big uh, conference uh, in Oxford, England, for the uh, A Type I. It was A Type, I, which is Association Typographique Internationale their first big conference, 700 people in Oxford, which I helped organize. Our slogan was, by the year 2000, everyone will have a favorite typeface. And that was sort of said as a joke. Mm. And somebody wrote me an email in the year 2000 said, well, you're right, they do. <laughs> and it's sort of true. I mean, in, the, in 1990, if you ask people what a font was, they would not necessarily know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Windows was just beginning to have font menus at that moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea that, you know, a font, what is that, like a fountain? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. In year 2000, 2005, maybe, we, uh, there was a TypeCon, which is an annual type conference, I think in Chicago, and we took a sign to the uh, Grant Park that said, what is your favorite font? <laughs> and we had a video camera. Shows you how long ago it was. We had video cameras then. Right. Uh, <laughs> And people came Beta up Max. and just said, hey, I like Ariel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or whatever. But they all they all knew that. And I'd say to follow that through to its logical conclusion, about 10 years later, probably around 2010, you could probably get a good number of people to say which fonts they hated. <laughs> right. right? Yeah, so I think one, of the papyrus. They're supposed to hate. Yeah. Yeah. Papyrus the papyrus and, and the curls well, they, and the hobo and all the, you know, like yeah, I, the most hate. hated fonts in the world. Yeah, it's really sad about that. I mean, all those Papyrus, Hobo, and Comic Sans are all perfectly decent typefaces on their own, <laughs> right, but right. they've just been overused. Uh, they're yeah. used for the wrong thing. Uh, Times Roman, no one will yeah. use Times Roman anymore right? because it just got overused. For some reason, Helvetica didn't wear itself out yet. Yeah. But people will look at Times Roman. Now, one of the things is that Times Roman is not great on the screen. Mm. It's a letterpress font. Right. So... Uh, yeah, I think what's happening is that people are beginning to understand that they want their own font. They want it. People would really like to have their own font in email. And I don't know why the email clients, why doesn't Google, which does everything else, make Gmail where you just put your own font and you can send it. Say it's a Google font. They can serve it off. You know, they have some very, very good fonts. You can pick something that you'd like yeah. and always write with the same font in your email. It will go on it to iPhones or Macs or Windows or I, uh, PCs of all kinds, Android machines go everywhere. They just serve it by. Yeah, they've got that in the Google Docs, right? They've got a. They have it for fonts Google fonts, loaded yeah. there. You but, can't bring other fonts, but you can. But probably... not in email. So I think it's just a matter of time before they'll. There's the email groups. I, I mean, I argued about this starting uh, at least 15 years ago at places like Microsoft, saying, "My God, what are you doing?" And uh, for the email group is really down in the trenches with every man, woman, and child mm. <laughs> on the planet. Mm. And the you know, people at Windows system level, they're dealing with, you know, IT guys. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, a different order of magnitude. It, it, they're not willing to, to get everybody stirred up. <laughs> yeah. And because it, it's hard enough, can you imagine the, the, you know, try to do technical support for Gmail? Holy mackerel. <laughs> <laughs> I would go back to the, the idea of your, your font being an active service. Mm. Not everyone who sends email understands that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. if you give people the choice, you're going to wind up with a lot of emails and fonts that you're like, oh my God, we're back to the desktop publishing days when people were like, 90 fonts, I'll use them all. Right. And highlighted yeah. in different colors. Well, they do that in their PowerPoint slides. Still. Yep. Oh, gosh. Yep. <laughs> Every slide should have a new font, right? Yeah. That's why they put them in there. 
that's the Franken deck. <laughs> Call that yeah. like the Franken deck. Franken deck. But the uh, I actually I think that that particular uh, cluelessness is a, is a moment in time uh, that it it will uh, people get much more sophisticated. Uh, you know there are. I mean, I don't think it's a question of intelligence. It's more like a question oh. of cultural awareness. Sure. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of things. I mean, look at fashion. That, I mean, there, there, are, there are whole groups of people who are complete fashion idiots. <laughs> but uh, most people get away okay. The, if you look at, and if you go, into, to, if you go to Copenhagen or Paris, <laughs> Tokyo, uh, even though you know formal clothing, formal dress, you know no necktie, is gone. Is gone. They look pretty good on the streets there. Mm -hmm. uh, Americans aren't quite so good at that. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll be slow on the fonts. But I think that as people get understanding, uh, fonts will start moving into more, much more consumer categories like music. Uh, mm -hmm. Not at that kind of mm -hmm. level. Not that and not that money, but it's, uh, look at the color thing, how uh, uh, you go to Instagram or Pinterest or those things, and people are like fascinated with color and talk about color and, and, and use that. I think mm -hmm. that kind of design awareness is just culture and people will start wanting their own fonts, want, exp want to break away from that monotonous corp corporate speak and have something mm -hmm. personal. Uh, you know, in, if you think about it, we're communicating. Everyone says, oh, why are you, who needs fonts? Says, There's more text now. Uh, of course, the planet has got many more people too, but each person spends so much more time writing and reading than we ever did. It's right. insane. They've all got their phones. They're all staring constantly. Mm -hmm. Now, some of them are looking only at videos, right. <laughs> right. but a lot of them are, you know, you see yeah. them, they're just texting. <laughs> <laughs> while they're you know barely avoiding running into columns and stuff right. <laughs> and why don't they text with like why not on on uh on, on, on sns te text messaging or or the uh, messenger in in facebook mm -hmm. uh or these you know whatsapp and everything else all the text mm -hmm. things wouldn't it be nice if you you knew your friend always use garamond because that's what they mm -hmm. they're a very kind of classy dude and mm -hmm. then there was a very kind of coaching italic that this beautiful woman is using because mm -hmm. she thinks it reflects her a little bit and you get happy about that and then there are all, all these wonderful designers coming in who are very craft oriented very calligraphy handwriting based uh that's a whole trend never mind the whole graffiti thing which we could talk about later but right i think it's moving toward much more individual uh, and of course, it's in my benefit if everyone has their own font. I really want it, <laughs> right, <laughs> and, right, and to avoid the Google fonts and actually pay a little money and license for it. Well, in your scenario, I am selecting my font, but couldn't the opposite also be true? If I want Jane, when Jane's text message comes in, I want it to read in a certain font because I associate that style with her. Yes, that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's it. You want to express your in the same way that you know someone like me. I still, you know, what year is it? What are you up to now? Twenty twenty one. I every day at work, I tend to wear a white shirt. I've right. been like that. I for a while during the, the coronavirus era, I started wearing polo shirts, thinking, oh, it's more comfortable. And then I decided that these old white shirts are actually more comfortable than the polo shirts. So I put that back off. Well, Jeff, when we get there, I will uh, assign you Comic Sans. I mean, every time you text me, it'll show up as Comic Sans. How's that? Sound? Well, that's like oh, we were uh, friends, Jordan. You can, you can have, it's like uh, changeable avatars. Right. Right. I yeah. think that it's all related. And I think that, uh, that as the world becomes bigger and there's more regimentation, more kind of group culture, uh, people look look for identification, look for expression. They want they really want uh, to 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 stand out a little bit, uh, even if they agree with what everybody else is saying. They don't necessarily want to take a contrarian stand, but they like to be their own people. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's interesting. I think that the last year has it's pushing them 
farther. I think that everyone is a little more introspective. And hell, we'll all learn how to do Zoom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Roger, so the guy I wonder at Google, if... the guy at Google is Matthias Duarte. Ah, okay. You probably know Matthias who that is. Duarte. Yeah. He he was I wonder home. if, and I know we've only got about uh, 10 minutes left. I would re be remiss if I didn't ask you for a big juicy story about uh, your days at Rolling Stone. And I wonder if you would share with us the time that you were asked to help with the redesign. Was it 77? Oh. Jan Wenner asked about the redesign. Oh, you wanted to know that presentation story. Did I tell the, you that? When one? you gave the presentation, yeah. Yeah, you wanted it's a funny story. Well, okay, here we go. The, uh, okay, Rolling Stone uh, had a look, uh, which is not entirely abandoned even now, um, but it was, an, it was printed on newsprint. It was a tabloid. By the time I got there, it was a side, side stitch, saddle stitch, mm -hmm. um, so that it held together, but it was not trimmed. Uh, so it was a uh, big shabby tabloid and uh, not that well printed. Four color printing on newsprint in 1970, in the 1970s was uh, sketchy. Uh, I always thought that we, they forgot that hand out the 3D glasses because <laughs> the colors were so out, far out of register. No. <laughs> it looked like it was done on purpose. And uh, so I came in 1975 and Jan Winner, uh, the owner and editor, famous guy, sold it, still, still on the masthead, although he sold it. Uh, he, he said, he, the, the art director was Tony Lane and he interviewed me, but then Jan came in like he always does. He says, I'll tell him what I want. So Tony says, what's that? He says, I, we should have our own typeface. And uh, I looked at him and he says, like Times New Roman. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. And that was a pretty you know, ambitious thing to pick as your example. Uh, and so when I got, it, got there, one of the, my projects was to think about what typeface should be the Rolling Stone typeface. And then I decided it, uh, we could do this by experimentation. We could put things into the live issue because in those days, every feature had a different typeface. It was, um, we designed each feature to look like the subject, uh, mm -hmm. not for text, just for headlines. And, mm -hmm. and uh, Esquire did the same thing in, in the 60s. It was, uh, it was a magazine thing uh, to do that, try to reflect it. And then, of course, our layouts, right, we always did one very adventurous layout, one really classic layout, and then one crazy layout often a failure. Uh, it was not, it was not, uh, it was considered okay to fail in those days. You would, you would try stuff. Uh, and people were not afraid of that, you know, the, what I called the dog food article, because it was just so horrible. And, but that, I don't think if we, if we had not permitted ourselves to fail, we would never had, it would never would have been as great a magazine as it was. And it really was fantastic in those days. Anyway, so we started trying out and I decided from looking at old type books that I love the Jensen revivals that were based on what the, the arts and crafts, the originator of the arts and crafts movement, William Morris did. He wanted to make a font. He based it on Nicholas Jensen's, you know, 15th century fonts from Venice. Why? I don't know. And then he kind of thickened them up and made them a little more Gothic, which was wrong. Uh, and they became insanely popular in the late 19th century. Every, and talk about, if you have a successful typeface, you, you can't stop people from, from pirating it or copying it. Everybody had a, an invitation of a, of a uh, Jensen, uh, William Morris Jensen. And in fact, uh, when he saw the one that American type founders did, he became so enraged that he said, that this, these people are, uh, are, if they copy another one of my typefaces, will go straight to hell. <laughs> and so uh, the, the Bentons, of course, immediately got another one of his and copied it. <laughs> and they, the name for that typeface was Satanic. <laughs> Anyways, so I love these Jensen's, these Morrisonian Jensen's, and we started using various versions in the in the in the magazine. And then I got Jim Parkinson to start drawing the fonts, uh, and he was a lettering artist who had done some work at Hallmark and stuff. I found him in, in San Francisco. He's still there, still working. 
it's almost done every magazine logo in the world, but, uh, and quite a lot of good type. He's on type network. Uh, and so we got the, over a period of two years, we, we moved this uh, format so that it was almost finished. And they were gonna have this offsite. They were having an offsite in the Eastern shore of Long Island. Uh, I don't know if it was Montauk, wherever, at East Hampton probably. In this big house and all the salespeople came because it's mostly for the salespeople, the advertising sales. And um, they, we always had um, some friends, you know, uh, uh, musicians. Paul Simon was there that weekend. Uh, Simon, who I never liked until recently, and now I love Paul Simon. It's like back in those days, he seemed so hopelessly square and pathetic. You know, <laughs> Simon and Garfunkel, give me a break. But now he sounds like you know, uh, like Bob Dylan or somebody. <laughs> he's, it's like really, he really was good. Anyway, he's still around. So the thought is, um, and then the Belushi was there, John Belushi, who all the Saturday Night Live, which was a brand new show then, they were. You know, Rockefeller Center was only a couple of blocks from our office. They would come, like after rehearsal nights, they would come over. We did a big cover on him. Lord Michaels was Jan's, the producer was Jan's, one of his close friends. Belushi became a friend of mine and he used to love my office. And I I think that Statue of Libertations may have lapsed by now, so I can admit there was a lot of drugs available <laughs> and that he may have been friendlier toward the drugs <laughs> than he was to me, but I accepted that. And we hung out quite a bit and uh, would go places and stay out and have a good time. And, um, but sometimes he would just show up in my office and hang out. Uh, I'll tell that story some other time. But he, he went to, uh, uh, when he went to, to, to East Hampton for the weekend. And uh, it was a big house, had guest rooms and a big pool. And uh, we had one hell of a party the first night. And then Jan said, why don't you do your presentation? First thing, I want to get these people out of bed and get them going. And they'll have to come see it. I said, 9 a.m.? <laughs> you know? So all these salesmen, I, mean, I don't know if you know advertising sales people, but they typically drink, at least they did in the 70s. And their eyes were like crusted shut. <laughs> Not a very good audience, I didn't think. <laughs> I didn't feel so hot myself. Uh, and I look, I'm trying to they want to do this presentation. In those days, we had slide projectors. You know, we had carousels, uh, mm -hmm. and I had it had it set up, but I couldn't get the room dark. It was the it was a uh, a porch that had all these French doors and it had shades on it, but they were uh, it was clumsy. And then I tried. I had the uh, projector sitting on a, a bar cart that was loaded with booze, which uh, the uh, it was part of the story. And so people finally, I said, we're going to do this. You got to get going, get some coffee or get, get comfortable. We're starting. And then I was closing the French doors and there's Belushi out across the pool. We're dressed only in his swimming shorts, kind of lumbering my way. And I thought about it and I looked at the bar cart and there was a bottle of Martel cognac. And I knew for, 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 for materials that Martel was John's brand. So I grabbed a bottle of Martell and waved it at him. <laughs> and then Kate went back in and closed the door. And so I turned around and thinking about how long away he, he, he was, how far away he was, I turned to the group and I said, well, thank you. I, I, I know it's hard to get going this early in the morning, but uh, I think you'll enjoy this. We're going to make some big changes. So I think that will be popular with, with your clients. We'll make a lot of publicity about it. But before we uh, start, I thought this would be the perfect opportunity uh, to uh, introduce our new associate art director who's collaborated on this project. And Jan Winter says, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I, I smile broadly and the French doors burst open. He just <laughs> bounced through and there's Belushi in silhouette because it's blinding light outside. You know, looking like on TV. Look, he was looking for the Kodiak. <laughs> and I handed it to him, and he was able to open a bottle of Martell with his thumb, with one hand. Because with the other hand, he, he got, he had the, uh, I gave him the remote control, and he put that in the, and then he grabbed this pointer. You know, those, I don't know if you've ever seen a telescopic yeah, pointer yeah. that salesmen used to always have. 
Uh, and one guy had this pointer and he took it and he went swat <laughs> and hit the button. It took a swing of the Kodiak and he gave the presentation. <laughs> and every slide reminded him of some crazy thing. And he made up reasons for why we were doing that. And he did captions of the pictures. And people were almost throwing up. It was one of the funniest things that anyone had ever seen. <laughs> I just sat down and enjoyed the show. That's so, amazing. Uh, later, Is he the best junior associate art director you've ever had? Yeah, well, at least the most fun. I've had some great associate <laughs> art directors. He, uh, at the, the head of sales, uh, what's his name? Welsh, Don Welsh came up to me and said, how much did you have to pay him? <laughs> Can yeah, we, to be up can that we get early. Him at the sales conference, right? Yeah, yeah, that was uh. a good, a good presentation. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you didn't fun... even have to give it. <laughs> yeah, that was the best part, and they loved it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great redesign you guys did. <laughs> the, um, you know, one of the fun things about being in the media business is that you keep you meet a lot of people, uh, and usually it's just for a short period of time. Uh, and uh, it, but then again, you'll see them again someplace, and sometimes they remember you. It's amazing. Uh, I'll, sometimes I'll, uh, I'll tell you the Lyle Lovett <laughs> story. Okay. Yeah. We might have it, to do it, another call. That had the Lyle, uh, Lovett Lyle Lovett and Leo DiCaprio on the same scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was great. I mean, doing covers, you'd meet everybody. Event, you know, just for a short period of time. Yeah. And it was interesting. You talk to other you know, photographers, art directors, and they would say, you know, everyone had the same favorites. Uh, who were the real people who treated you like a real person? Mm -hmm. uh, you can guess which list Madonna is on, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> for example. I can. But, but we had people like Clint Eastwood, you know, we do a cover with Clint Eastwood. It was like, you know, an afternoon with your dad's best friend or something. It's great. Right. Oh, that's cool. Well, Roger, I know All we're right. at, out of time. I really appreciate oh, yeah. you spending the afternoon with us, man. Absolutely. Thanks for pleasure. Uh, hanging out and chatting. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it sounds like we might have to do a part two, man. And, uh, and hear some <laughs> more, more of those stories. stories. And talk about the future of type and design, man. Uh, yeah. I, people may not know, but you're right here in town with us. Like you're, you're, you're in Tampa Bay with Local. us. Local, so. yeah. Uh, well, Roger, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Nice, nice having with you. All right, man. Have a great Take rest care. of the night. Adios. Bye. I'm here too. <laughs> All right. Hello, Ashton. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs>